Yes, so, so um, positive results for that part, please. Yes. So you want me to say something about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think the judgment speaks for itself. Um, the controller of customs, uh, when he was appointed to his active position, replacing uh, Peter Chico, who is still mad in it, um, decided on review of the documents that there was really no basis for the action that was taken. That position taken was not dissimilar to what two previous controllers had stated. Uh, of course, that's contrary to what Peter, Peter Chico thought, but two previous controllers had decided there was no basis for that action they were asked to take. And when he came, he reviewed the files and he agreed with that. And the action and to return the vehicle. Um, of course, the lady opposition um, felt that was wrong and that he went to the court to ask permission to file for judicial review. And I think if you read the judgment, um, the judge is very clear in his reasoning that you cannot give permission to file a review if in the opinion of the court there is no possibility of winning the case. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And the decision was to dismiss that application for leave and to ask him to pay costs. Um, I think, again, it is always very clear um, the origins of, of the case and what was involved in it, that it was clearly malicious and vindictive and why it was being done. And the court, in a sense, has, although not looking at the merits of the, the evidence per se, just the principle of it, that there was no basis um, to review the decision of the controller. He had all the authority um, to make that judgment call and to act as he did. Um, for me, you know, who continues? I mean, I've always maintained my position on it, um, why it, the action, actions were taken and what was the intention. It had nothing to do with anything that anybody knew or believed or even had reason to believe that I had done something wrong. It was clearly malicious and vindictive. That's what it was. And, and you know, I know that's what it was. Um, and I, I do have to go into the, the facts again with you, but anybody who's familiar with the facts w would see what it was. And I mean, the reality is that there are so many instances, if anybody had reason to believe that that was a wrong act, there were so many other acts too that could have been acted upon. And I can give you a long list of things which were done, you know, under the last government that clearly violated all procedures. The vaccines, for example, millions of dollars, you know, um, some of the awards that were given, you know, I don't want to go into all of that right now. Um, we have a lot of good news to talk about, but um, I'm glad that the court has ruled the way it ruled. And there will be a couple more victories coming very soon. Mm -hmm. um, I know you were I mean, it's kind of, I don't say it's uh, we've beaten on all horses, but I mean, we've, we've constantly lamented the state of regional travel. But it, it seems right now it's actually getting to a point like where it's getting really bad. And you know, some situations where people um, are stranded here, and I know we're branding as well, like, this as this destination, but you want people to come and then they're having difficulty in, in getting back to their, um, their native home. So what has been the talks like with you and maybe your kind yeah, of colleagues yeah. or maybe CB and whoever, um, to really kind of calm down on, on this issue? Well, I mean, we've had two positive developments. One, Caribbean Airlines have expanded their service um, to St. Lucia. They're now doing a daily out of Trinidad, and they're expecting as they get more planes, which is their biggest challenge, and the challenge for most airlines now not having the equipment, and of course, in some instances, the crew as well, for them to be able to have normal service. But Caribbean Airlines is expanding, and they indicate to us they will continue to expand and on the weekend on Saturday night they actually hosted an event welcome home right here in St. Lucia um, as part of the celebration of the expansion of that service um, so we're looking forward to Caribbean Airlines expanding even more um, Inter-Caribbean has been trying they too have challenges with equipment that they are waiting more more planes for them to be able to expand their service 
and of course Liat is still in abeyance. I know the Prime Minister and some of the other Prime Ministers met on the weekend um, to discuss regional air travel and this morning I'm sure we'll get an update on exactly what the decisions were and how we're going to move forward. And like you said, we've spoken about this many times in the past. St. Lucia needs, you know, a stronger regional connectivity. Um, St. Lucia is a preferred destination uh, and we need to be able to connect more with the Leeward Islands and with Barbados. Trinidad seems to be well connected now. We're well connected with Guyana for British Airways. So the question of how do we connect more with the Northern Caribbean and of course with Barbados. And in terms of, in terms of the um, FNs, would there be some way, some kind of ceiling to, to, to keep it you know, regimented? Because you know, it's yeah. so much. FA is a problem both regionally and international. I mean, I, I can tell you the cost of traveling out of the region um, is also very high. Airlines seem determined um, to maximize the, the profits at this time. There is still a huge demand for, for travel and there's scarcity of, of options. So the, the law of the market will tell you if you have high demand, low supply, prices will go up. And they certainly are um, using the situation as much as possible. What are the options for government? Certainly government cannot get involved in price control of FAs. You, you really cannot do that. The other option is to probably reduce taxes, government taxes that exist whether you could reduce it um, and lower the cost, um, at least even if it's regional travel, um, because the international travel, the, the, in fact, the, the law that was provided, that was passed to finance the reconstruction, you know, upgrading of the Iran or International Airport, um, tied that loan to um, the, the taxes, the airport taxes. But maybe it's probably time for us to rethink the regional component of it, whether we should not reduce regional taxes. Because when you look at the breakdown of the prices and you see what's the price of the airline cost as against taxes. And remember, if you're traveling to a destination, say you go to Trinidad, and if you stop in St. Vincent, Grenada, each, each instance you pay the departure, ta the taxes of those countries, because it's not a direct flight. Um, so, you know, it, it's really a challenge. but. It is probably an option that can be considered by government. Yeah, but it would be, it would be natural approach to carry Well, no, you can do it just for your destination. So, mm -hmm. persons traveling to your destination or from your destination, well, from your destination, will pay that less tax because you don't levy it on them. Um, so, you can do so. But if others don't do it and you alone do it, yes, there might be some benefit, but I mean, it's a marginal benefit, but it's still a benefit. Um, and because St. Lucia too, we have a lot of events and activities in the country and we really have to find a way to have more regional travel. Um, the ferry service is, is back to normal, so our links with Martinique, um, Guadeloupe, Dominica is well established for that medium. But still there are people that want to travel air and we have to find a way. St. Lucia has stated this position very clearly that we are supportive of a regional solution both private and public to resolve the connectivity issue and we are committed to that. Uh, we, if it does uh, to that same touch is for that attached to the well it was attached to the loan um that was taken from Taiwan, right? Since uh, the, this administration went in different way, does this tax does it need to be applied still? Well the different way we've gone so far is more in relation to the scale and scope of works for the terminal. I mean, based on what was designed by the last government and the escalating costs that we saw, um, we realized it would have been a disaster waiting. Um, maybe not in the early stages, but when you have to do the superstructure and the finishing. So what we are doing after we've consulted the International Finance Corporation, the arm of the World Bank, is to downscale it to a more reasonable um, requirement and to ensure we control costs. So they, 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 they funding structure has not been changed. It is more the scale and scope of the works that we are rethinking. Of course, I mean, if we're now going to get back a private operator who's willing to go back to the old model, um, I'm not sure how that's going to work because you've already started the construction. A contract has been given to a contracting firm um, to, 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 to build the, the new terminal. 
Um, but COVID, the war in, in, in Ukraine and inflation proved the point that we took, the, the position that we took was right. That if you had still had in place a private-public partnership, all those uncertainties and consequent costs would have been that of the private investor. But the fact that we disbanded that and we decided to do it all public, watch what has happened. COVID, nobody saw COVID come in. Um, the war, nobody saw the war come in. And inflation, supply chain issues, that had just escalated costs, almost 40% increase in costs. Now we have to carry it. And that's one of the reasons why people for huge infrastructure projects use the PPP model. Because as small states, it safeguards you against those kinds of uncertainties. And we explained that in Parliament. But the then government felt, no, 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 they had it covered. I guess they probably believed they could have um, dealt with those issues if they came up as well. But obviously, you, do, you, you have to face the consequences. With the rise of Julian Alfred um, onto the international stage, speak to the importance of athletes like the for the group of the island sports tourism. Yeah, I, 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 well, I'm a big supporter of sports tourism and um, sports generally. Um, in the earlier life, when I served as permanent secretary in Youth and Sports, we actually established with the Tourism Authority, Tourism Board then, a very vibrant sports tourism program. And that time, um, Reds Pereira served as our consultant. And of course, you know, when we built the cricket ground in 2002, when it was open, all of that was part of one, um, providing more modern facilities for our young cricketers to be able to develop and of course to create avenues through sports tourism. We also build the, the stadium in Vieux again with the same view of developing our athletes and exposing the, the country. Um, so let me start off by um, ex really wishing um, you know, Julian Alfred all the best today. And we're certainly looking forward to her meddling you know, in the finals. Of course, you know she's from Cicera, you know, Cassius South, so um, that holds special significance um, to me as a parliamentary rep. Um, but it is really critically important. Um, one, the successes of somebody like Julian Alfred serves to inspire our generation of, of athletes coming up that they too can come from a small community in a small playing field, a small school, and become a world superstar. It also tells them that there are livelihoods in sports because she's now a professional athlete, signed a major contract with Puma, and therefore do not believe the only way you can be a success in life is to be a doctor, an engineer, or an accountant. You know, you can be a success in the creatives and you can be a success in sports. Um, and of course, for us as a country, Brand St. Lucia, um, we become known, you know, internationally. Um, Darren Sami brought tremendous, you know, coverage to St. Lucia being known, you know, all over. Um, one can argue that the bias would have been England, Australia, India, Pakistan, but that's where the biggest cricket followings are. Um, track and field is global. And just hearing the name Julian Alfred from St. Lucia um, is a tremendous boost for the country, the identity of the country and for you know just the, the brand value of St. Lucia. It doesn't mean people from all those countries will start coming to St. Lucia, but it establishes greater brand value. For us as a people, there's a sense of identity and national pride that one of our own can be at the world stage and excel and even medal. And it says to us as a country, as, as, as a people, what we're capable of achieving, that achievements globally is not only for those with big landmass and big population and high GDPs, small countries, small islands like ours, can excel. So we certainly want her to succeed. We want her to medal. I hope she gets the gold, but if not, um, you know, to still medal. Uh, we will, like she said, we will all celebrate in St. Lucia. And I, I remember when I first became parliamentary rep in 2016, um, a lot of the talk, I don't know how many of y'all remember that, the former minister of sport, Sean Edwards, had you know a support program for our young athletes and the new government discontinued it including julian alfred 
and they thought the minister was using the so-called minister's account wrongly and using it was actually supporting those athletes and giving them the support that time she was in jamaica and she went through a few months of great uncertainty how she's she, there was even the thought that she might have to come back from jamaica because the support line which was established by then minister edwards had been stopped um, I'm not going to go into any more details, but sometimes when you hear people now celebrating Julia and Alfred and her successes, you know, you, you have to wonder about the sincerity um, of, of those celebrations. Because I distinctly remember those early months when Julian had no support being sent to her because it had been stopped um, because of that. Um, but let's celebrate and let the past be the past and let's look to a, a glorious future. Speaking of future minister, correct me if I'm wrong, is it not true that as we speak there are at least three hotels under construction and is it not also true that this is the first time that amount of construction is taking place in probably more than five years? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to leave the hotel construction. Uh, I'm going to plan a tour for us to actually visit some of the sites mm -hmm. and to give you an orientation to some of the things that are going to happen because the Galaxy Hotel in Sh and Canals is well on its way. Um, the Casaba Beach Hotel is well on its way. Um, right yeah, there. and the Marriott at Point Serafine is well on its way. Um, the Shabusha, we finally relocated all the persons who were living in, in the area. Um, ISL actually built homes for them. And the road has been redesigned, the land has been acquired, and they are about to go out to tender to build a bypass road. And once the bypass road has been built, the hotel, the Grand Hyatt, will actually start construction. Um, and there are a couple of other projects that will come on stream. And uh, you're going to talk about the, why was there a drought last well, time around? Yeah. What's the difference now? What water fertilized the economic yeah. to facilitate that construction? I, I think, first of all, um, when we came into government and the Prime Minister, of course, appointed me for tourism and investment and I met with those investors, there was a confidence crisis that there they are. They had a couple of those hotels actually started and the Kenyan Tunis, the Shabusha, for example, um, the discussion of the Marriott, um, as far back as then. And when we spoke to them, why haven't you all built a hotel? And they, they started giving us all the reasons why they, they, they had not built the hotels and why they had not even started. And we had to almost restart negotiations with them and to say to them, no, let's sit down and have a serious conversation. And the, the Galaxy one at Canels, nothing had happened for five years. The Shabusha, nothing had happened for five years. I mean, nothing. You know, I mean, people who had not even relocated, um, the persons who had been living on the, the, the lands which were going to be used. And the investors virtually just gave up. I mean, they did not feel that the government was really serious about the national interest. And I want to stress that the national interest and what was required to be done by the country for the sake of the country. And we had to make it very clear to them that, no, this is how we're going to do it. And, and you have the confidence in this government. This government is going to do what has to be done. It's still very difficult to get things to move quickly in St. Lucia, I can tell you. Um, the public service, the procedures, whatnot. You know, investors who go to other parts of the world will tell you how quickly they can get things approved and done. And our systems are still very slow and deliberate. And, and sometimes it frustrates them. But we have been working very hard to keep the investors and the developers, you know, to know that we are supportive of them, we are putting you know their interests on the on the front burner, and that we are working with them, and we've also had to renegotiate some of the agreements. Let me give you a classic case of what take the GPH agreement. Despite all that has been said about the pots being sold, whatnot, when we came to the table as a new government, there was an agreement. There was an agreement that had been negotiated with GPH. How much was it for? How much it was for? Mm -hmm. A lot less. Mm -hmm. We then said to them what they had in that agreement was not sufficient. And we made them add the Sufre waterfront. And we also made them add um, the boardwalk at the other waterfront. Um, they, that, was, that, that was not part of it. We had to say to them, you know, well, sorry, maybe can you give us some more? I mean, we certainly want more than that. Um, so we, we've had to sit down and renegotiate. 
Um, the same way with the Canal's development, we have to sit with them and say, no, no, let's discuss this. The Shabusha one also, um, we have to sit down with them and, and renegotiate aspects of it um, because we still believe that a lot more should be, you know, for this country and for us to benefit more um, from, from those agreements. So it, it has been, first of all, building investor confidence in the government that we are about the country and we want to push the interests of the country first. And that's the primary thing. And secondly, we will work with them to make sure um, you know, the, the projects advance and to cross a lot of the hurdles that exist, regardless of which government is there. There are administrative hurdles and you have to show them that you care about the project and that you are going to work hard to make the project succeed, um, to be able to move it forward. But there's a lot that will be announced in, you know, in, in due time. Can you tell us about CIP plans and what it's being used for? Well, I, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good question because we've been very critical of the last government in terms of nobody up now knew exactly what the funds were being used for. Um, the, the, the two sides to the money, money that goes into the National Economic Fund and monies that are generated as excess um, capital from the operating accounts of the CIP. Monies have been used for largely national security reasons, largely to provide support to marginalized groups, um, support for um, families and for other marginal groups in St. Lucia, and for debt relief. Because as you can imagine, and you, I'm sure you would have known, this government has not been going to parliament um, borrowing every Tuesday like used to happen before. And we've mounted a lot of debt um, in the last few years. So the Economic Fund has been used to some extent to provide that buffer for government as it relates to our national debt management, um, as well as support for marginal, marginalized groups and for national security um, purposes. Um, we are about to enter a new phase with the CIP, where the resources that we have been able to save and to, 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 to manage will now go into a specific projects and I will leave it to the Prime Minister at the right time when he is prepared to announce um, the national infrastructure projects that you will see um, CIP will be used for. Um, so with regard still to the CIP, we haven't gotten a report so is there a place we can get a report as to how much the country has actually... No, it is stable in Parliament. The last one was stable in the end of last year. The law requires it to be tabled by October of each year. Was it read in Parliament or was it just... No, it's stable. You don't read it in Parliament, okay. you just stable it. It has the listing of the, 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 the nationalities who have gone to... I think the last government removed that from the legislation. Mm -hmm. So this administration cannot put it back? That requirement well, well, I mean, we thought when we launched the program, we should. It was necessary. Um, the last government removed it. They claimed that no country was doing it, and there was no need um, for it. Um, so we've continued with what the law requires us to do. So you agree with what the administration... Well, you know, for, for me, it's neither here nor there. I mean... Um, at the time we did it, we only wanted to have 500 applicants per year. That too was removed. Um, and I think we cannot go back to where we were in 2015. It's 2023. The industry has changed a lot. Um, and uh, what we, ha we can't go back to what we were proposing in 2023. I mean, it's such a flexible and evolving industry. Um, in fact, very soon we'll be making some major announcements as it relates to the CIP. Um, we believe we have the best regulated and managed CIP unit, and we're going to make it even stronger. And we will be making some announcements in that regard and make some strategic changes. When we launched the CIP in 2015, it was then focused at primarily attracting investment into the country, especially through hotel development. Right now, I don't think we need that anymore. I mean, the hotels that have been built in St. Lucia, only one is CIP. Most of the investors who come in don't need um, CIP. They believe St. Lucia is an attractive destination right now. So we don't really need that. So should we continue with it in that form? Or should we reorient it to what our present day needs are? So many of you people who are um, acquired passports through that um, media, what are they, the majority are actually investors or are, are they just paying the required? No, the majority are investing in hotel development, in the hotel development. Okay. So when it comes That's to... That's the last one, last one. Yeah. No, I, I think his son was a buzzer. Um, no. All right. Yeah, they still, and he was there from the beginning, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, you were asking? Oh, um, when it comes to the visa requirements to the United Kingdom and the whole issue with CIP, how does, where does it which stand when it comes to that? Well, I, I, I read online mm -hmm. a story which claimed to say that other countries would be um, required to have visas to enter the United Kingdom. Um, we're not aware of that. Nobody has said that to us. Nobody has, um, you know, informed us of this. Um, I saw the oppositions almost celebrating that they will need visas to go to, to England. We were not informed of that, and we don't know, and we are in constant contact with our partners, and no one has said to us that such is the case. There's no worry that since it occurred in Dominica, it won't occur here? Well, in, in the notice put out by the UK government, they said why they asked Dominica to, to, to require visas. Right. That does not apply to us. It doesn't? No. Okay. Go ahead, Ashwin. Yes. Just, um, uh, you were speaking about the ports earlier, uh, but I can't, uh, I can't help but notice on Friday, it seems the ministry is gearing up you know, to, um, you know, I guess, welcome in the new cruise, cruise season. season. Um, so what are some of the outcomes of that, um, that meeting with those um, yeah. stakeholders and what? And how, do, how are we looking um, for this cruise season? Well, I, I think this is going to be our best cruise season um, on record. Um, so it's going to be a bumper cruise season. And we are under a lot of pressure. And there are, there are quite a few things we need to, to work on. Um, number one would be the heavy demand for beach facilities on cruise days. Um, a significant number of cruise passengers want to spend a day on the beach. So they want recreational facilities, they want food, drink, what on, on beaches. So if you go to VJ Beach and Ridgery Beach, you can see the crowding that takes place there. So we need to develop a number of other options that visitors can also use. And of course, some go down to Anshastne, whatnot. So we are looking at a number of other spots where we can develop. Um, you know, to, to offer other options. So you don't have that heavy concentration in a few beaches. We also need to upgrade the, the facilities at the beaches. So especially toilet facilities, and that's a critical need, for example, at Ridgery Beach, because the visitors now have to end up using restaurants and other you know places when they need those facilities. So we've taken some decisions at the government level in terms of identifying more um, areas that we can develop and to be used. And secondly, providing facilities, you know, at those existing ones. And thirdly, enhancing security, law and order. Because if, if you do go there on a cruise day, um, you see the congestion and you see the confusion and we need to manage it properly. So you will see the NCA getting a lot more, um, you know, intense in its activities to be able to manage those um, facilities. Of course, you know, we signed the agreement with GPH, so we'll start transitioning towards that kind of management of the cruise sector. Um, the vendors arcade will be redone, the World Customs Building will be broken down, and that entire area will be rationalized in terms of traffic and the movement of, of people. Um, you know, in Banan, again, an area of interest to me, the fisherman's village will be established there. But first of all, we need to relocate um, the people who are living there and we need to decide exactly how we're going to, um, you know, build and construct a facility there. Of interest to me, for sure, is the, the boardwalk. I'm really looking forward to see how we can create a vibe for passengers leaving the cruise ships, walking to Castries, that they have an extended area. Of, of activity and engagement, um, more opportunities for vendors, more opportunities for our creatives. So I'm really excited about it. You've met with the people in Banan, really Yeah, we've had a number of meetings with them and we'll have some more meetings with them. You know, Kareem, I thought you'd have asked that question. Which one? The minister has a vacancy for an attache. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, who wants the job? Who wants the job? I thought you were talking about who wants it. The job? Somebody yeah. Yeah. I was going to put out an advert <laughs> and, and see. Yeah. Hiram, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, my question is uh, back to regional travel. Um, the early for regional travel have been a, a problem with us. But some people are saying the size of the plane seems to be why do we not go into the smaller planes? Um, between St. Vincent, within that area, there are a lot of companies there. Why do we not get them involved in the regional travel? 
Because why we say um, look, some of the planes are about 60, 80 passengers, why not get the smaller planes to go around the islands? Yeah, I, I, I don't know anything about that. I, I have no idea well, about the economics of, of, of those things. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, At, but just think about it. Just think about it. Yeah. At one time, we saw the twin otters, those small 12, 15 seaters. Mm -hmm. They've moved past that to have bigger planes. Mm -hmm. There must be a reason. I, I don't know. There must be a reason why they went to bigger planes. Yeah, so I don't know about they going back to smaller twin otters. Well, I ain't sure how I would feel, you know, that becoming the primary way of traveling. I, I don't know. I have no idea the economics of, of civil aviation and flying between the islands. I, I don't know. I can't. Thank you, Mr. Sure. So you'll send me. No. Um, as we close with the emancipation, what are the plans for Junior Well, there's going to be an announcement this week about the host communities. And on September 1st, we're going to launch the calendar for Creole Heritage Month. Um, and we're not exactly closing the door on um, emancipation yet. We have some big activities coming up, including the, the, the street art, the mural. So that's area that you, you, you spoke into that you Yes, street trust me. I, I, have, I really fought for this to happen. And I wish we can do a number of buildings in Castries. I really. For me, it is special. I mean, you, you remember I've said about my love for street art, whatnot. I, I think when you drive into a city, you must see art. You must see the expressions of who we are and what we are about. Um, so I'm a big supporter of, of the street art. And city is really coming alive in color and activity. And, and, and I think we should do so. Um, we have some more activities coming up for Creole, for emancipation, including La Rose. And already some of the La Rose groups have been, you know, having their activities in Suzel on the weekend. It was a big activity. I know there is one taking place between Viewfort North and the Valley, and there's quite a build-up for La Rose. So um, that that's going to be exciting, you know, as we we, we move forward. Um, I should also mention on Saturday um, this week. I'm not sure whether y'all accepted y'all invitations for the World Travel Awards. Latin America and the Caribbean um, section, where you know we will see which awards San Lucia got. You know, historically we always won the world's leading, well, Caribbean leading honeymoon destination, and also the world. Last year we won the Caribbean leading adventure destination. So we hope in this year we can certainly cop again those two awards and maybe more. So on Saturday we have is a, is a major international event. Um, the World Travel Awards. This is the Latin American Caribbean region um, sec, um, awards that will be given. So I hope I will see you all there on Saturday and we'll celebrate any victories that San Lucia have. Um, but it's really important for, for, for us as a country to see what the world thinks of us as a tourism destination. Office of the Prime Minister. <laughs>